up here over from uh, Louisiana. Uh, I'm sure most people already know her, and so she doesn't need an introduction, but I'll give her one anyway. Uh, <laughs> she got a, a BA at Duke, MS at College of William and Mary, I assume it was Vims. Uh, PhD from LSU. Uh, she's now a, a associate research scientist at the LSU Agricultural Center and a research uh, biologist at USGS. And she's going to talk to us about everything about research. <coughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's great to be here. I always laugh. I was telling someone it's both my husband and I are oceanographers, and we live three hours from any real water. So it's always nice to go somewhere where you get to see water um, when you get out of your car. So um, I thought today I would just talk about some of the work that we've been doing in Louisiana that relates to oysters. And I know a lot of you have some Louisiana roots, so a little bit of this you may already know. Um, but Louisiana obviously has some extensive coastline and coastal marshes, and it's estimated there's over 12,000 kilometers of shoreline in Louisiana. And this is because we have a lot of really big estuaries that all have very unique signatures, uh, depending on what river is flowing into the estuary. So it ranges from one of the largest rivers in the world, the Mississippi River, to some of the lesser known rivers, Calcasieu or Sabine, over on the western side of the uh, coast. And within each of these estuaries, they're composed of a number of habitat types. So when most people think of Louisiana, they think of the marshes. And that's where a lot of our focus has been over the years. This has been on the coastal marsh, probably because it's what you can see, it's what you can um, measure with remote sensing. And so a lot of our focus in Louisiana has been on marshes. But we also have extensive shallow water habitats. And so one of those is submerged macrophytes, which exists pretty extensively, um, in the, even in the turbid waters. But we also have extensive oyster reef habitat. And these, the eastern oyster is the only native um, hard bottom habitat or reef building organism in Louisiana. And it is, provides pretty valuable habitat. And so this is probably, if you've been to any oyster talk, this is a NOAA slide that kind of touts why we care about oyster reefs from an ecological perspective. Um, and it's that they're considered ecosystem engineers. Um, they provide a complex habitat in areas that's mostly soft bottom sediments. They are filter feeders, so they contribute to maintaining or promoting better water quality. And they're also being used more recently because they provide hard structure, they can change the wave currents and baffle energy, and they're being used um, in coastal restoration as living shorelines. But long before we valued them, for their ecosystem services, um, they have a long history of being a, basically a cultural and an economic important organism in many areas, and in Louisiana in particular. So this is a graph of sort of the production of oysters, and you can see that the um, in red has been Louisiana's contribution. So Louisiana has always contributed a significant proportion of the eastern oyster production to the United States and across the Gulf Coast. In recent years, there's been some a lot of changes on our coasts, and so this has led to some <clears throat> rethinking about how we might be managing our oysters and how we want to maintain our oyster production, which this bottom slide, I think that's from Alabama, but that shows where we're starting to start thinking about aquaculture. Um, right now, in Louisiana, most of our oyster production is from on bottom, where oystermen lease the bottom areas and essentially farm the area by ensuring that the bottom habitat is good for oyster production. And they also go to public grounds where they can pick up seed oysters that the state has helped maintain and place them on their leases. So the problem with this is that uh, as we're going to see in a minute, there's been a lot of changes in our estuaries in terms of the estuarine conditions. And so, because oysters are fixed in space, as the water conditions change, oyster production also moves. And so a lot of farmers, oyster farmers, are not very happy about how that's impacting their bottom line. <coughs> so some of these changes, as I said, in Louisiana we talk about 
marshes and this is sort of the classic analysis or graph that dominates a lot of our discussions. so this shows the coast of louisiana and in red is land or marshes that have been lost in the last century yellow is predicted land loss up through two thousand and fifteen and the little parts of green are where they're suggesting that there's land gain so you can see that in the middle of this of the state there's some land gain and that's where the atchafalaya river is coming out and there's a bit of river delta building and then also at the mouth of the mississippi there's a little bit of green where they're predicting some a bit of land gain so this obviously has huge impacts on the environment and how these estuaries are functioning when you remove all of this marshland on top of that we also have evidence that from climate change and other conditions salinity and temperature which are two of the dominant controls on oyster growth and mortality in our estuaries are going through long-term changes so on the right of the graph is a figure from one of joel fodry's works it was actually done in alabama but it shows how temperature in our waters has been increasing over the long term from the 70s or 80s to more recent years and on the right is a graph that a former postdoc of mine and former student here mike lowe had put together from some louisiana data that showed that within louisiana estuaries our salinities have actually been decreasing over the long term and so we see in many of our estuaries the general trends of increasing water temperatures and decreasing salinities on top of all of that the land loss the change overall changes in temperature and salinity louisiana is engaged in a large-scale restoration plan um, every five years the coastal protection restoration authority has to come out with a revised called the coastal master plan um, on the bottom of this graph is sort of their graphic of all of the restoration projects that they've approved and that's part of this 50 billion dollar plan that they have put in place and are implementing in order to try to restore or save some of our coast um <coughs> so this apple is rolling <laughs> uh, save our coast so i'll <laughs> All of this um, restoration, which ranges from diversion of rivers, if someone wants it, they can come get it. <laughs> um, diversion of rivers, which is going to change the salinity, the nutrients, possibly even the temperature within some of the estuaries, to marsh creation, where they're moving mud around to try to create more marshes. And the picture on the right shows one of the living shorelines they created to try to um, promote oyster growth, but also to protect erosion. But in some total, all of these things together means that our estuaries, which are normally dynamic, are changing um, even more than we might expect. And our recent paper, this is by Reese et al, um, <clears throat> using expert opinion, basically assessed that oyster reefs along the Gulf Coast and Louisiana are pretty vulnerable to changing conditions. Um, <coughs> And this is on top of, there's an older paper in 2011 that many people might be familiar with from bioscience that indicated that globally oyster reefs may be functionally extinct. The um, reason I'm not using that is that that paper has zero Louisiana data in it because we lack maps and historic maps for Louisiana. So a lot of what we're doing is um, inferring that many of these changing conditions in the estuaries are impacting the oysters. So within that setting, oysters are an important part of Louisiana's culture. And there's a lot of work and time and money that goes into the management of the oyster fishery. Um, so there's the on-bottom aquaculture or on-bottom farming that I talked about. Um, you know, about 50% of the Gulf of Mexico production comes from Louisiana and it's mostly from this on-bottom farming. Um, Louisiana has also, through some of the oil money and restore money, invested in the state-of-the-art oyster hatchery, which is supposed to contribute to both oyster production by providing seed oysters um, to the farmers, as well as possibly help implement um, a bigger aquaculture industry 
and also provide seed resources to some of the restoration projects that are ongoing. Um, and while it's not operating at capacity, the hatchery was built to produce up to a billion larvae per year to provide to oystermen and restoration practitioners. Um, oyster restoration is also a big deal. You have a lot of the NGOs who are pushing for a lot of reef restoration. The Coastal Master Plan has some very large scale projects that deal with oyster reef restoration. And I couldn't find any numbers based on what I know. I know they've invested over $100 million already within different projects for oyster reef restoration um, for non-economic uses in coastal Louisiana. But all of these are based on, when they go in to do fisheries management, when they go in to do restoration, they all use tools to try to cite or to determine how much you should harvest, where you should put culch, or where you should restore oysters. And all of these models, these are two, Tom Sonia does a lot of the work with habitat suitability models, and along with Eric Powell, some fisheries production or shell budget models. All of these are based on understanding the oyster. And so uh, while I work with both restoration practitioners and some of the fisheries managers, they all seem to think they're doing something different and so I always tell them it all comes down to the oyster. Until we understand what conditions are conducive to good oyster growth, and until we understand where, um, when oysters will die, we can't do good restoration or fisheries management. And this is a cute oyster, right? That, that's <laughs> off one of our um, restored reefs. Um, and that was, I couldn't find a really good oyster picture uh, to make people love them. So what I was going to do is talk about some of our work that tried to get at what we think are some of the important questions that we really haven't answered yet. So one is, you know, how do, although we have models that are based on sort of the generic oyster, we know that conditions in Louisiana are fairly low salinity, fairly high temperature. So, you know, can we come up with better models for Louisiana oysters specifically? So how do local oysters respond to salinity and temperature variation that's typical within the estuaries where they're growing and where we've had good production historically. The second is what I call, or actually this comes from some of Tom Sonnet's work, can we identify killing conditions? So, you know, we have sometimes, like right now, with the high um, freshwater inflows, we have periods of really low salinity. But we also know that in some of these areas that typically get low salinity, the oysters survive. But if we're going to promote aquaculture, we need to know what a killing condition is. So what can the oysters not survive through? And you know, so far we don't have any good models that can help us predict where we should not be putting the oysters. The third question is, we have a diversity of estuaries. I talked about how we have ones that are affected by the Mississippi River to ones that are affected by smaller rivers. And we have good oyster production across these different estuaries. So are there, do these oyster populations from these different areas, how do they respond? Do they respond the same to the same salinity and temperature conditions? Or are there population specific differences? And are these just phenotypic response differences or can we identify genetic differences? And in determining that will be important as we develop broodstock if we wanna promote aquaculture within these different areas or if we want to ensure that are hatcheries producing larvae that can be put out in specific estuaries and survive under those conditions. And then kind of under that is the question, you know, after all of that, does it matter? Can we implement a generic model to inform Louisiana management or do we need a model that's adaptable to different populations? And so I'm gonna talk about, go through this, talking about some different lines of evidence and, and approaches that we've been using to get at these answers. So the first thing we wanted to do was Louisiana has been, um, because this is an old fishery, they've been collecting data for over 40 years on oyster populations across our different estuaries. So we also have an extensive uh, network of monitoring stations that collect daily or hourly salinity and temperature. So we combined, we looked at some of the data on what are called the CRIMS or Coastwide Reference Monitoring Stations, which is on the right side of the graph, 
And we also collected the 40 years of data from Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries, where they approximately monthly have gone out and counted um, <clears throat> the oysters and looked at oyster size, the demography of the population across the state. And this is work that I did um, that Mike Lowe, um, graduate up here with Mark Peterson, um, did while he worked with me where we analyzed these 40 years of data and wanted to look at how do Louisiana oysters across the coast respond to salinity and temperature. These are the um, graphs for mortality on the right and growth, um, mortality on the left and growth on the right, if you're looking at it. Uh, and essentially what our conclusion was that compared to what was in the literature and the other models, Louisiana oysters actually show peak growth and lowest mortality at lower salinities and higher temperatures than we previously thought. So based on this long-term data, we've already kind of shown that these oysters in Louisiana, those populations, are probably more adapted to lower salinities and higher temperatures than a lot of the models and the data that we've been using to try to inform our management model. And so that's kind of important to know. Um, the other thing we tried to look at with these data was can we identify killing conditions so again, on the left, um, we actually we were looking at salinity. So it's percentage of days that were had a salinity greater than 15. And what's interesting there, to us, 15 is a high salinity. Um, if you're working with oysters in Texas, 15 might be a low salinity. Um, what's interesting here is these are with adult oysters. So the top graph is looking at oyster growth. And as you have higher salinities, you get better growth. But you also, as the number of days over 15 increases, you also significantly increase your mortality. Um, so <clears throat> higher salinity is not necessarily better if you're doing on-bottom aquaculture. We still don't know if that mortality is from predation, because we know predation increases with salinity, or if that could be from dermo. Um, and that's something that still needs to be figured out because you could, if it's predation, off-bottom aquaculture might be okay in the higher salinity areas. On the other side of the graph is for both mortality, and we are looking at more extreme conditions. So the top is the days below a salinity of five. And you can actually see that up to 50% of the days less than five um, did not significantly increase oyster mortality, and we do have populations that live in low salinity environments. So low salinity at least alone, most people thought, was deadly to the oysters. It's not necessarily deadly. On the bottom is higher temperatures. We use 30 degrees Celsius, and it's kind of mixed. It may be because there's an interaction with salinity and temperature. Um, it may be we have some evidence from the lab that 30 may not be that detrimental, but 32 or 33 might be slightly higher threshold. So the other thing that we went to look at um, is <coughs> we know that there are um, within our estuaries, so this is when you give some a GIS person sort of free license and they get all artsy and then you look at it and you're trying to figure out what's going on. So this is actually the coast of Louisiana, but the coast is white. So you, that's why what you're seeing basically in colors are all of our estuaries and our shallow water areas. And on top is, um, this is just an example. So here we took seasonal winter salinity. On the top is the mean salinity, ranging from zero in yellow to 32 in the darker blue, so that's mostly some of the offshore areas. And on the bottom, we just thought we'd look at salinity variance. Um, the little fleur de lis is showing approximately where New Orleans is, if you wanted to um, orient it. And so we know Calcasieu, Vermilion, Terrebonne, those are just some of the dominant, the big estuaries where there is oyster production. And the main thing is to show here, as I said earlier, that each estuary has some very different conditions um, within it. And so we wanted to look at oysters from some one, using these long-term data, are oysters from the different estuaries adapted to the same salinities and temperatures, or do they respond the same way? And what we did was we took 
um, data from two adjacent estuaries, that was oyster growth and mortality. And we found periods where uh, salinity and temperatures were the same. So basically we matched up, even though the estuaries were not the same over the long time period, there would be periods where you could match up, um, so we call them synced stanzas of time. Um, this is some work done with a master's student of Tom Sanyats. Um, and, and we were looking at, do they respond in terms of mortality and growth in the same way to the same salinity and temperature periods? And so on top, we did it by every season. I just showed winter and summer. So you can see that in winter, basically if the lines are parallel, it meant that the oysters were responding in the <coughs> same way. And so in the winter, we found no difference. But when we looked at summer response to mortality and growth, that the populations from Barataria, which are in orange, and from Breton Sound differed, um, differed significantly. So the populations were responding to the salinity, same salinity and temperature in different ways, which gave us sort of our first piece of evidence that maybe there is some local adaptation to um, salinities and temperatures. Instead of just looking at the long-term data, because that's pretty messy when you start getting into it, we started to try to explore it with some controlled, some field testing. In this case, we took two populations from some very different estuaries in Louisiana, and we placed them in cages in one location in the field. Um, so we have renamed it Louisiana population one and Louisiana population two. On the left is the cumulative mortality, so we tracked their growth and the mortality over two years. And you can see in the mortality graph that one population had almost 70% mortality over a two year period, while the other population had less than 30% mortality. So these were oysters taken from two different places and then grown in the same place. And so there's a pretty significant response in terms of their mortality. In the case of these two populations, we were trying to see what was causing the mortality. And so if you look at the right graph, this is the infection levels for dermo, which can kill the adult oysters. And you can see that by the, sec the 2015, by the second year, the population that had the highest mortality also had significantly higher um, infection disease. And so this is part of some work done looking at disease resistance and disease tolerance. And so here, this indicates that one of the second population of oysters was a lot less disease tolerant. Um, so again, here's another example that there's local population differences. And then the last one that we did, and this is taking four populations of oysters, and this was taking oysters, so we expanded a little bit outside of Louisiana. We went all the way to Texas, where we have oysters that grow in 35 to 40 parts per thousand and we took populations from Louisiana growing in five to 10 parts per thousand. And in the lab, we acclimated them to salinities ranging from two to 44. And again, this is um, a rough measure of condition or health of the oyster. Um, you can see, particularly at the low salinity, that there was a difference in population response um, to these lower, to the different salinities. And so, all of these kind of indicate sort of a phenotypic a response of the oysters to the different conditions of salinity and temperature. Um, and we don't have any results, but we're working with some geneticists who are looking to see if they can identify genetic markers, which could then be used for breeding a low or high salinity tolerant um, populations. So just for this part, um, you know, the question of how do local Oysters um, vary with salinity and temperature. Compared to what we knew before, we, sh we were able to show that Louisiana oysters grow at lower salinity and higher temperatures than previous models suggested. The, the idea of identifying killing conditions is still something we're trying to figure out. Um, you know, this obviously from some of the, our other work is probably population dependent, but when we try to model it, and I'm gonna show you some models that are only growth models, in order to really get at you know, where you can have good production or where you can have good restoration, you need to understand when the oysters will die. We still struggle with figuring that out. 
And are there population specific differences? We have um, amongst this, we have field studies, lab studies, and long-term data that indicate that yes, there's probably local adaptation of the oyster populations. And we're hoping to get evidence to see if we can figure out some genetic gen markers of that. And so the last part was taking all of this and doing some more studies to try to figure out, you know, does it matter and can we implement some sort of generic model that will help? And here, again, although I say, you know, their death is really important, we are just trying to get at growth. And we um, worked on an energy budget model for the oyster. So a lot of, if you know the history of this stuff, it really shows that food and temperature are often used to drive a lot of these models. Um, especially when they're used for aquaculture. So the Pacific oyster, where they've done a lot of energy budget models in France is really intensive culture. And so food is often their limiting factor. We kind of assumed because we lack data in Louisiana estuaries, um, and what data we do have indicates that food may not be limiting at least the way we're managing the oysters right now. Um, it's not a limiting, but salinity is obviously a critical parameter. And so we wanted to try to figure out how to implement salinity within this energy budget model. And from that, we looked at the literature. So one set of literature that worked, <clears throat> did one model um, on mussels, suggested that salinity might affect their growth through basically basic metabolism, or what they call somatic maintenance. So basically just what it takes to survive. While other, a lot of the other models have looked at salinity through its effects on oyster filtration rates, because they've shown that if you change the conditions, the oysters may reduce their filtration or close up, and then they're not getting as much food. And so to figure out which model approach made sense, we did a number of studies. So one was doing some lab studies, and this is just using one population of oysters, where we measured their filtration or their clearance rate at different salinities. And then we also measured their oxygen consumption rate, which is sort of a measure of their basic metabolism. And what we found, if you look at the right, is the clearance rate. That salinity clearly affected the filtration rate, as many of the previous models had done. Um, uh, the oysters. So that obviously is one way that we needed to incorporate salinity into our energy budget model. But that salinity did not affect their oxygen consumption rate, which is on the right side of this. Um, <coughs> and so the idea of you know, the effect of salinity on metabolism or somatic maintenance is probably something we could ignore. But we also wanted to run it, kind of test it with a model. And we did that by putting oysters at a low salinity site in Louisiana, Cocodry, and a higher salinity at Grand Isle, Louisiana. And then um, we compared model outputs to observed data. So these four graphs, the black dots, are observed data in terms of growth of the oyster and biomass and shell height, which are two standard measures of growth at our low salinity site, Cocodry, and our high salinity site. And we ran the model. So basically, all the blue lines indicate where we implemented an effect on the metabolism or the maintenance of the oyster, while the red line was where we implemented an effect on the filtration rates of the oyster. And essentially, it supported our lab studies that showed that really the main effect that we needed to consider was on filtration rates. And so that kind of made us fairly confident that we had a growth model that was pretty solid for our oyster, could be implemented in Louisiana. And our plan is to try using this, um, getting data from different populations of oysters to see, you know, basically in the end, we want to know is the population effect significant enough to affect the growth within a year or two, which is how long it takes for our oysters to grow to adult size and harvest size. And so we're going to start trying to implement it between different populations to see if, if, if it matters. Um, but this model is also being used um, now using sort of a generic model for Louisiana, and we can start.
trying to use it to see what this will mean in terms of if we start putting aquacultured animals out in different parts of the bay with higher or lower salinities and temperatures, <clears throat> what will it mean in terms of their growth to an adult size? And so we can start playing with that for growth. Again, I just have to say we still are lacking mortality because obviously if you're an oyster farmer, you don't care how fast it grows if it's gonna die before you can harvest it. So this is kind of um, where we are. We know that Louisiana oysters are potentially locally adapted. Um, we know that we need to continue testing different populations. We have some extremely low salinity populations in a couple locations in Louisiana that we haven't uh, been able to uh, bring into the lab, but the state has, has collected some for us and they want us to look at it. And we have some geneticists who are trying to you know, identify some genetic markers because this can be used to help develop better brood stock um, as our hatchery gets online and starts producing these millions of larvae. Um, and the idea is that we can hopefully match some of the brood stock to the local conditions where you'll be deploying oysters. So what are some things that we're missing? Um, you know, in the future, we focused on salinity and temperature and trying to figure that out. But there's a lot of other things that are changing in our estuaries. Um, one of the things that we've always, you know, we, we've shown that the oysters might change their filtration rates and the food intake that they have. But there's also evidence that with changing um, salinity, fresh water, higher temperatures, it changes the food, the potential phytoplankton, the potential food community of the oysters. And Dr. Beth stouffer has been at the University of Louisiana Lafayette um, for a couple of years, and we started working with her, she's a phytoplankton expert, um, categorizing the food and looking at what the oysters are eating. Um, some of the potential effects include, I think they've shown that with the higher fresh water, you get more cyanobacteria. And so are, will the oysters be filtering those preferentially, or will they reject them and still be able to get all the food that they need? Um, so that's something that I think is potentially important as things continue to change that the, and as we implement more intensive aquaculture, um, you know, if food is going to become a limiting resource, we need to know that um, once we start putting a lot more oysters in the system. The other big thing that I think is important um, that nobody has really gotten a handle on <clears throat> is the idea of What's going on, there's, there's different ideas that our oyster population may be having some problems because we're low, lacking habitat or we're lacking recruitment. <coughs> and we haven't fully figured out how to start approaching this, but in looking at some of the long-term data, um, the graph on the right is kind of our first approach, our first attempt, although the data haven't really been standardized to look at the 40 years of data, of statewide data, where they measure um, size class. Basically, we can pick out you know, any oysters that are less than 25 millimeters, what we might call spat, and look at how the densities or the counts of spat have changed over the years, over the months, and within different estuaries. Um, and here, the heat map is zero, is that blue going up to red? Um, being the high number. These numbers mean nothing because they haven't been standardized. Um, but we were trying to look at trends. And a couple things, two things that we kind of picked out and we've talked about with the state wildlife management is that you know, there's perhaps a reduction in the spat that they've been counting. We're trying to figure out if that's methods or if that's a real number. Um, but that there's also a shift to later months when they get higher recruitment numbers. And that's actually something that the state has noticed, and they've actually shifted some of their management, their harvest open seasons, in order to reflect this later recruitment period. And so whether that's real and why it's happening and what the implications are is something that still needs to be um, worked out. And I just put this, this was um, some work that Eric Powell did which could relate to some of this reproductive stuff. Larger oysters generally are thought to produce more, um, more, more larvae. Um, and there's evidence that there's a decrease in the large oysters 
across the Gulf Coast, and this is based on some of NOAA's muscle watch data. Um, but there's a lot of different ways that this needs to be explored to figure out um, if there's an issue here with reproduction. The other thing is we talk about population connectivity, so the oysters as adults are fixed in place, and then they release and the larvae can float around for one, two, or three weeks. And so if we're decreasing the amount of habitat or if the habitat where the reproductive oysters occur is shifting, there may not be a place for these fat to settle. Um, and so we have to start thinking more spatially about how we manage the oysters. That generally um, some work from North Carolina and some other places have shown that reefs don't necessarily self-seed, that often the larvae will go off to other reefs. Um, on the right is some work from the Chesapeake Bay where Ron Lipschitz had suggested areas where there's sort of broodstock sanctuaries that might provide a lot of the larvae to, um, based on dominant currents and stuff, to other parts of the estuary. And Louisiana is actually thinking in this way. So this is on the right a map from Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries where somebody sort of thought through um, this is from the eastern part of the state. Um, you can see the Mississippi River along the bottom. And then this is right above it is Biloxi or Breton Sound. And then the second estuary is what we call Biloxi Marsh. Um, in pink are some of the existing reefs that have been mapped in this area. And they've gone in and on the green stars is what they propose as potential broodstock reefs. Um, these were just kind of placed there when I asked them opportunistically. They haven't really thought about currents and where they have good oyster resources. But it at least shows that they're starting to think spatially about where existing reefs are, where um, in red is sort of where they're doing culch plants or restoration of the bottom. Um, and then the green would be protected reef areas as much as they can protect them out there. Um, but as we think, start thinking about reproduction, and we need to start thinking about connectivity between the reefs. And this, um, the other thing, so keep that picture in mind, although I'm going to bring it back up. Um, when we start implementing some of our models in the spatial pattern, um, this is, again, the Breton Sound estuary. So it was the bottom estuary in that last map I showed you. And this was some modeling looking at oyster production or biomass um, under different restoration uh, scenarios. So on the top are what they call river inflow. So they're talking about diverting some of the Mississippi River water in order to build more marsh, and it'll freshen up some of the estuaries. And then sea level rise scenarios, and then combined <clears throat> man river management and sea level rise scenarios are sort of the bottom four. And in blue to red is basically the predicted biomass for a one-year growth cycle for the oysters. And what you can see is that biomass will shift depending on what the scenario is. And what's really interesting is when you look at Louisiana's latest idea about how they're going to manage their resources, in gray, the gray circles are showing the same area, spatial area. So right now, where our existing reefs are and where the state is thinking about placing some of their broodstock sanctuaries don't match up with any of this modeling in terms of where oyster can grow or where biomass production is going to occur in the future. So we still have a ways to go in trying to think about how we're going to manage our oysters in the future in coastal Louisiana. But it may, you know, what those areas may show is that if you're going to set up any type of aquaculture farming, um, barring other things like oil development that might prevent you from putting them out there, that may be where the, the good conditions are going to be in the future. So there's a lot going on um, with the oyster restoration and production within coastal Louisiana. So there's been a lot of movement recently about developing more off-bottom aquaculture. Although Louisiana is probably the slowest, I think they were the first to start along the Gulf Coast in trying to promote off-bottom aquaculture. 
um, because of a lot of issues. They're still working on trying to permit a lot of that. Um, we're still working on the on bottom farming, which is fixed in space. Um, and oystermen are starting to have struggles with how to maintain their own production when they can't control the salinity and the water quality over their own leases. So there's going to be a lot of changes, I think, in the near future. Um, but some of the remaining challenges as we go to either figure out how to manage it better or how to identify where the oysters are going to do well is this idea of identifying killing conditions. Um, they can be, the oysters can be pretty resilient, but until we can model <coughs> the depth, it's pretty hard to manage um, and identify good areas for oyster production or restoration. Um, we still are working on, we know that there's locally adapted populations, but how important is it and how can we use it to basically build a better oyster? We're going to develop a good brood stock. Um, and if we talk about aquaculture or restoration, should we be using our hatchery to try to produce oysters that are tuned in to the future, the local or the current or future estuarine conditions. And then there's a lot of things for anyone looking for something to do. Um, changes, we don't know what, you know, food is limiting or not. And will there be changes with the changes in freshwater inflow? Um, and we know very little about recruitment trends and habitat availability, as I said early on. I didn't use a well-known 2011 paper on oysters reefs being functionally extinct because Louisiana is not included in this global review because we lack maps of both historic and even current reefs across coastal Louisiana. So that was all where I was going to end. Um, and this work is, has been done with a lot of different people. Um, we work with a number of different labs on sort of the long-term data set modeling, um, physiology, um, and funding has come from both state, federal resources to get the work done. So that's all I have, and I'll take any questions. Any questions? So I know the um, state of Mississippi um, does phytoplankton sampling, at least over there. No, no, and that's when we started doing some of the modeling, part of why we assumed food was not limiting was that there's almost nothing um, there. There's a couple chlorophyll surveys, transects that have been done long term, but that was really it. And so um, Beth Stouffer at ULL is one of the first phytoplankton, and we have someone at LSU now that does phytoplankton work. Um, so they're just starting to get into it. So you mentioned that the uh, salinity was uh, negatively correlated with the filtration rate. Uh, does anything indicate whether or not that's a change in the physiology or whether that's a result of like clogging? There, we did do um, in this little thing that our collaborators from Canada had a thing that measured valve opening. Okay. Um, and so some of it is that they'll shut, they'll close up. Um, okay. And so it's reducing the amount of time that they filter. Um, I don't know anything. Clogging would probably have more to do with sediment. If that, you know, when we have high turbidity, then maybe some clogging from that. Okay. So you said the state doesn't have that much data. Are they trying to gather more data? Are they implementing new techniques to try to get this data? And are they? In their future goal, are they relying on aquaculture to offset, or are they actually going to try to restore these reefs? It, or are they restorable? Right. No. I would their, love to know, uh, but uh, the last I heard was that they're. Um, I mean, don't quote me on this, but my sense is that they're going towards aquaculture and the hatchery producing seed as their future, but it's kind of mixed with this idea that, as I said, you know, John Supan, who was there, spent 20 years trying to get permitting for aquaculture. There's a lot of pushback from the, farm, the oystermen. And so Louisiana was probably the first to try to implement off-bottom farming. And I think we're now left and left behind by Florida has 
pretty, they already had clam aquaculture, so they were able to implement it pretty quickly. Alabama has some, and so Louisiana is still lagging. I think we have four. We have one permitted area um, in Barataria Bay near the hatchery for aquaculture, off-bottom aquaculture. Um, and they're still, they have ideas of other estuaries where they want to go, um, but they have to get the buy-in from the oystermen and they have to get the permitting done, so. This, this whole approach with going for, you know, the genetically good oyster, seems like your work suggests that a way to approach it would be to look at the system within which you want to culture them and find other systems like that to maybe transplant oysters from or something because they've already been adapted by the, the history of that system or something like that. And might, yeah. I wonder if that would be, and then I don't know how you, how would you, I wonder how one would use genetics to kind of refine that or something. And as opposed to just trying to get one oyster that works everywhere. Right, like the dandelion lion oyster. It's really neat what you're showing is all the local adaptation. Like people say that oysters are tolerant across a wide range of salinities. Well, within that wide range of salinities, it seems like there's differentiation in terms of the, the adapt, you know, right. how, how well they're acclimated or adapted to those conditions and that there's, and then how does that all work with the connectivity thing? It's, it's kind of mind boggling, but it's really cool <laughs> to think about. Yeah, yeah, well, we've kind of talked about, I mean, the, so the, the hatchery is working to, I think, with the farmers, they've talked about triploid oysters, but right mm -hmm. now that are adapted locally. Right now, the <coughs> triploids, the only ones that they use, actually use oysters from the Chesapeake, or the, either somewhere on the East Coast, at least from the Chesapeake. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to figure out which ones they could use down here to develop a Gulf of Mexico um, triploid. And then the idea, and that's where, you know, we started looking at the kind of artistic GI spatial map was trying to get at this idea of how do we define zones within the estuary. Um, and so 25, 30 years ago, um, Earl Melanson, who's a oyster bi biologist, I don't know if it was in the 80s, um, came up for Barataria Terrebonne Bay, these oyster resource zones. Um, and he did that by basically going and interviewing all these oystermen and having them circle where the oysters were good in drought years and in wet years and came up with oyster resource zones. So we've been kind of playing with some of their interpolated data of salinity and temperature. Uh, we think we need food in there to see if we can come up with some, you know, ideas or classifications for oyster resource zones within the different estuaries and then you could target it. But Part of it is figuring out what's important. So is it mean salinity in the winter? Is it salinity temperature in the summer? Is it the extremes? And that's where the killing conditions to me is everything because if you're gonna tell somebody to invest all this money in oyster aquaculture, but every five years they get, you know, this really, this killing condition, low salinity, then you're not gonna make, they're not gonna like you very much. And so figuring that out is, it's going to be interesting. Uh, this is kind of coming out of what my lecture was in Benthic Ecology today. We were talking about phenotypic variation and dispersal and stuff. And I'm wondering if maybe the environments themselves are kind of selecting phenotypic plasticity in the oysters. Like if you think about the, the oysters right. dispersal and coming in and colonizing and then what's left, what actually grows out and, and survives in that regime is a product of like a phenotypic plastic kind of response. Well, that's what some of inter the interesting stuff we have. So there's one area where the oysters grow, Vermilion Bay, that has salinity goes from zero to 35 regularly, but mean salinity might be five or six. Um, and interestingly though, when we looked at just some of the preliminary stuff for the genetics, they were similar to ones from a very different estuary. And so we're trying to figure out what I mean, one, we're trying to figure out if somebody moved oysters and we don't know and they all survived that year. That's probably always our big thing. And then the other is, are there conditions that are slim, similar that might have selected them? But the hard part with all this population stuff is that, you know, we don't, I mean, for year, for decades, I've, I've worked there for two decades and I was always told, we rearranged projects and we're working in Alabama because we were told we can't take out-of-state oysters and put them in the waters. You talk to the oystermen and the aquaculture people, and they've been doing it for years. Yeah. So, 
you know, so some of it's hard, and that's why getting into genetics and can they identify differences between some of the populations? Um, can we kind of, I mean, we have to track it, it's sort of a detective work. One, are they different genetically, or have oysters already been moved all over the place? Um, is kind of our first question. I was gonna ask that of you. Are you? I mean, <laughs> Louisiana has the largest amount of leaseholders, right? I mean, that's the majority of their production comes from leaseholders. Yeah. They're going to get their oysters off public grounds and probably from their neighbors and everybody else. Right. So there's been a high level of mixing. Right. In Louisiana for years. So how how do you how do you go about teasing that out? I and mean, how are y'all trying to do it in well, your study so that you feel like you're at least getting? Well, we have a lot of different discussions because that, that's, I mean, the geneticist says, you know, well, there'll be selection. If you've moved something from this estuary to that, and that, that's high salinity and that's low salinity, they're all going to die and they're not going to, or they're not going to reproduce. And so there's a natural selection. I, I don't know if that's true or not. Um, and maybe you have some, you may have some honest oystermen who just tell you, I used to get them from here, but they all died, so I quit and went and Yeah, there. I mean, most of the oyster, well, I don't know. I mean, they seem to be pretty honest. I don't know. I take them at face value. But there's, you know, the, the, yeah, I mean, the issue is that mostly they move them locally because it costs money to go all the way across the state, right? So we know within an estuary there's probably movement, and we know where the public seed grounds are. And they, you know, the state <coughs> pretty much knows who works where. So within a region, we were pretty confident that nobody took oysters from Sabine and then boated them all the way over to the east of the river. Right. Yeah, I mean, you don't know. I mean, or, or a researcher took yeah. a bag of oysters and then put them out there, which is what I've done. So maybe they reproduce while they're in their bags. I, I, I don't know, but yeah, it's, it's complicated. But there is, I mean, because we have the, lots of other studies where we've shown phenotypic differences in performance. When we take oysters, you know, we'll take them from different estuaries, we'll get them to the hatchery, we'll spawn them so that they have the same history, and we'll put their progeny out in different areas, and there's very different responses. So there's something going on. But, well, one more question? Yeah, but when, when you say that they, they are similar, like for example, within the same estuary, uh, what, what kind of uh, genetic data will we use to characterize that? You have to talk to the geneticist. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> I don't <laughs> understand yeah. it well yeah, enough to, if, to if show my There's some relatively recent movement, there's, there's ways to, to get some insight into that with the, the high marker density that we can use. You know, yeah, so. Maybe so with some limited marker there, there may be ways to kind of tease that out a little bit. Yeah, so it's with Morgan Kelly. I don't know if you talked to Jerome about it, but she's been doing uh, some yeah, yeah. genomic. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know. I don't know enough. Yeah, I, I actually, just show I, how I, much I, I don't know. Is that whether or not time we talked about it, it was the process. Right. Yeah. Well, thank you very much.